Welcome to the Sustainable Production Forum. Hath squile, each tenoyup, toits tenak quien quenchamen, cease quien sna, on hath in squalowin, on wanoxed in squalowin titsits. Welcome everybody. It lifts my heart to welcome you to these ancestral lands and waters of the Huamathquiam, the Tesleweth and the Skolmish Old Olkameo. I am Skolmish and Stalo and I'm standing on these shorelines where the salt water meets the shoreline and and comes back into the forest with ancient trees, ancient cedar trees, ancient fir trees and ancient maples. Welcome Osiem. It's our job at CBC Radio-Canada to report on what we, as Canadians, care about. Politics, culture, sports, entertainment. But there's a bigger picture, something Canadians care about even more, the environment. It's what all the rest of it hinges on. We wouldn't be here without forests, wildlife, and oceans. Stories on the environment often have a way of making us feel powerless and small. Who are we against a hurricane? Who are we against a wildfire? Who are we against a changing climate? We are more powerful than it seems. So we're not just going to report on the environment. We're going to take action and help preserve all the things we care about. We've looked at how we can do better and set some goals for 2026. And that's just the beginning. Our ultimate goal is carbon neutral. As we move towards zero, we will report on our progress. Keeping you informed is our job, after all. Ontario's film and television industry is committed to a sustainable future. The Ontario Green Screen Initiative is a public-private partnership of industry leaders that have assembled to provide the tools, relationships, resources, and educational opportunities required to make real environmental change. Visit OntarioGreenScreen.ca for more information about how you can take part. Welcome to SPF 22. I'm Zena Harris, president of GreenSpark Group and creative director of the Sustainable Production Forum. Hi, I'm Melanie Windle, executive producer of the Sustainable Production Forum. Thank you for being here with us. I'd like to thank Cease Weiss for that wonderful traditional welcome. I'm tuning in from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, and Pakani, the Sutna Nation, the Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. 
Today, I'm tuning in from the traditional territories of the Puyallup and Coast Salish peoples of the Puget Sound area. This virtual event is coming to you from around the globe. And if you are unsure of whose traditional land you are watching us from, you can visit native-land.ca or indigenousworld.org to learn more. Those links should be popping up in the chat shortly. Please share with us in the chat where you are tuning in from. We are so excited to welcome you back to the seventh annual Sustainable Production Forum. It's a delight to gather again. For the better part of 2022, Zena and I have been discussing your pain points, your successes, and figuring out how we can have an impact and move the needle in decarbonization in our sector. We have been meeting with leaders, experts, change makers, and disruptors for the last six weeks, having incredible conversations, and we are excited to share them with you throughout the month of October. If you have occasion to be in Vancouver, Toronto, or New York City, don't forget to check out our in-person events. Please introduce yourself. We love seeing the community grow. Something special about SPF is that it is a gathering place for stakeholders across the entertainment industry. And we are very grateful for the support, collaboration, and allyship we have developed with our partners. The SPF 22 lead partners are, Presenting partner, Real Green, Creative BC, Motion Picture Production Industry Association. Platinum partner, MBS Canada. Signature partners, CBC Radio Canada and Telefilm Canada. Please visit our website or check out our sponsor page on the event platform to get to know all our partners and vendors. A bit of housekeeping. Please take an opportunity to engage with the community board to post or take our polls during sessions. Say hello to our partners and vendors. Please help us gather important measuring points by participating. Join the social media conversation by using the hashtag SPF22. We are thrilled to bring together these two powerhouse directors in documentary filmmaking for an inspiring fireside chat. Welcome to In Conversation with Jennifer Bachewall, presented by program partner, Canadian Media Producers Association. Jennifer's films have stunned us and shown us truths that are unforgettable, provocative, and necessary to understand our complicated relationship with the planet and natural world. Today's moderator is Liz Marshall, an award-winning Canadian filmmaker who's written, directed, produced, and filmed multiple impactful documentaries around the globe since the 1990s. Liz Marshall's current documentary, Meet the Future, chronicles the birth of the cultivated meat industry through the eyes of a visionary CEO, Dr. Uma Valetti, proposing a game-changing solution towards a sustainable climate future Meet the Future is narrated by Dr. Jane Goodall ex and executive produced and with music by Moby. And our special guest is Jennifer Beshwal. Jennifer has directed and produced documentaries for over 20 years. Among other films, installations and lens-based projects, she has made 10 feature documentaries which have played worldwide and won multiple awards nationally and internationally. In addition, she has made many other pieces of acclaimed work that have won many awards, including The Holier It Gets, Act of God, Watermark, Manufactured Landscapes, Long Time Running, and Into the Weeds. Welcome. This is about food, this is about seed, this is about health, this is about the soil, this is about environment. This is not an Lee Johnson story. This is bigger than me. Hi, Jen. Hi, Liz. Hi. How's the Sunshine Coast? Oh, uh, life changing. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I think about you sometimes because I know that you lived in Roberts Creek in a previous life wrote a motorcycle and wrote for the local paper. I'll never forget <laughs> telling me that. 
um, yeah, so I moved here a couple of years ago and it's stunningly beautiful. I'm, I'm so glad and I'm a bit jealous. I mean, I love Toronto, but as you know, I grew up on the West Coast in Victoria and I, I'm just so attached to that landscape and that yeah. ethic and the ocean and anyway. Mm. Yeah, life changing. Um, Jen, when the Sustainable Production Forum reached out to me and asked me to do this conversation with you, this fireside chat, I rearranged my schedule to make it happen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to begin just by acknowledging that, you know, you don't only make incredibly important films that address incredibly uh, significant and current themes. Um, and themes that I relate to as a filmmaker, environmental, uh, you know, social, political, global um, subject matter. But your work, uh, you know, has really made a difference in our documentary community, not just here in, you know, our small but very robust Canadian context, uh, but globally, your work, your body of work is very cinematic. So it, I like to, sort of think of it more as, you know, there is a documentary cinema renaissance that has been happening for some time now. And it's exciting to be part of this community, um, a fellow filmmaker, but, you know, you've certainly influenced me around showing and not telling. And I'd like to just center on that for a moment because, you know, your current work um, is arguably, you know, the most overt, most political, and it's character driven, which is different for you, um, aside from your earlier work, which was also a bit more character driven. Yeah. Um, but it, there's also in your work, um, a sort of uh, neutral, dispassioned kind of tone at times. And I, my, my first question is really, do you think that's more of a Canadian or European cultural sensibility? Because when you compare that to American documentary, which is very polemical, very fast paced, um, you know, very lack lacking in nuance, but yet very commercial and often trending on Netflix. How would you address or talk? How can you speak to that in terms of the state of the documentary right now in the world? Totally. And Liz, you're you're an incredible filmmaker and I'm really honest, honored that you're doing this and that you change your schedule around and you're my friend. So this is going to be fun. Um, that's I feel like that's overstating it a bit about the influence for sure. But I would say that in in the very early stages when I was doing a master's thesis at McGill in theology, and thinking about, oh God, I guess I'm going to be an academic for the rest of my life. And kind of just being so um, dissatisfied with the form of inquiry, how limited it was, how um, also just how, you know, the, 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 the few people that you reached, you know, students, I, I used to joke that only three people read my thesis, my dad, my advisor and the outside reader. <laughs> and, and I think that I turned to film sort of instinctively as a way of trying to move people in a way that I think art moves people intellectually, emotionally, and viscerally all at the same time. And what I was finding in traditional documentary then, and I just, I'm self-taught, right? I didn't go to school. I just learned how to do it. I learned by doing, but I I, I remember thinking, God, visual language is always subordinate to text in these traditional docs. It's always like, you know, you say that this person lived here and then they show their house and, and it was so literal. And I, I kept thinking, wow, film is a, a visual medium <laughs> primarily. So what is this? Like, is this just supposed to be a stand in for what we consider to be truth, that we're being objective, that we're showing the things that people are saying? And I immediately thought about, okay, a vi visual language has to be metaphorical, it has to be philosophical, it has to be evocative, and it has to be visually compelling um, as a way of bringing people in. So from the very beginning, I was sort of grappling with that relationship and really tried to explore it as our films you know, um, progressed over the years. 
So that's one thing. But regarding the sort of dispassionate versus polemic um, question, I would say that the, the reason that polemics are, um, inter, let's say, entertaining <laughs> and also potentially interesting to people or impactful is because they are reductive. They, they paint a world that is black and white that is not black and white. And I've always been interested in trying to represent complexity without trying to clean it up to be black and white because the world is not like that so right. if you can if you can acknowledge complexity and still have a path to action or response that is a much richer conversation i think i think the filmmaking is richer and i think it also um gives credit to the intelligence of the viewer to be able to parse things that don't necessarily land you know, in a in 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 a happy ending or or a very concrete ending, and so we've always been at pains um, just to do that. And I remember getting criticized for that for the the true meaning of pictures. Our films about Shelby Lee Adams, our film about Shelby Lee Adams, and his work. It's you know the ethics of representation in photography, and it when we film screened it at Sundance, I remember people saying, "Well, you know, you don't come down on one side or the other." And I said, well, look, I've been living with this film for over three years and I still don't know. I, I still find it ambiguous. So I'm not gonna force a, a conclusion um, uh, because that just makes a tidy ending for a film. So that's one thing. The Renaissance of documentary, I feel is, it is global. And it's really interesting that, that the Nan Golden film, the Laura Poitras won at Venice, um, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed because we're, we're at a point now, I think, given the sort of truth wars <laughs> that exist everywhere, where ethical, thoughtful, beautiful, compelling representations of reality are almost more difficult to achieve than compelling fiction or drama. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your work is highly um, philosophical, and yet your latest film is extremely political. Um, and it, you know, you launched a campaign today. Can you speak to that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll step back and say sometimes I've been asked because. I feel like I'm kind of in the elder statesman portion of my career where I've done enough films that, that people sort of talk to me like I'm, you know, I've sometimes think about retiring and all, all of that. Like they talk to me like I'm, I'm a sage, but I might not have a lot left to give. But one of the things is what's your style, like your style of filmmaking and, you know, what is the thing that runs through every Jennifer Bay 12 film? And it really bugs me because nothing runs through all of those films except curiosity a kind of acuity of perspective a a really strong ethical um philosophy of engagement um and the subject is is always front and center like the the context and the subject is what dictates the form and so in the films that we did with ed which i know we're going to talk about the trilogy um, that was very much about experiential awareness. It was about witnessing. It, it took a, it was sort of an attempt to, to translate, especially in the beginning with manufactured landscapes, what Ed did in photography into intelligently into the medium of film, which was, let's take you to these places you're responsible for, but would never normally see. With Into the Weeds, um, this is this is the story. It's a kind of a David versus Goliath story of an ordinary person taking on a massive multinational corporation, Monsanto, now bought by Bayer, so now Bayer. And what that means and what that required was real precision around the the science that was demonstrated, the points that were raised, the trajectory of the trial. And then built into that sort of bed, the bed of the trial, were, were these um, pulling back to, to try to understand the more systemic effects of herbicide use, pesticide use in general, 
um, and the bigger questions we have around the way that we interact, uh, interact with the natural world. And so one of the things that I thought about when we had finished the film was, well, we have this tool. I wanted to create an historical record of this moment that could live on um, as a, a case study of what it means when there is a David versus Goliath fight like this, number one, and also to be used as a tool for regulatory change. And we're at a moment where um, there are a lot of regulatory reviews going on around the world. In Canada, the PMRA has been um, requested to revisit the idea that they will raise the acceptable residue levels of glyphosate in food. That has been challenged by a number of ENGOs. Um, we are supporting that challenge with a petition to ban glyphosate in Canada. You know, in Quebec, it's already severely restricted. The mayor of Montreal, Valerie Laplante, has the strictest regulations for herbicide use. You can't even buy them on the city of Montreal. Like, it's not like you can't spray. They're not available for sale, right? It can happen. There are alternatives. So we've launched this petition. We've, we've started this impact campaign that is very targeted. It's targeting that. It's targeting the EU where glyphosate is up for renewal. Um, and if it is not renewed, we'll have incredible repercussions globally. And we're targeting the US where the EPA has also been forced by the Biden administration to review glyphosate, both because of its um, effects on biodiversity and because of its potential, potential carcinogenicity. So I feel like that this film has a unique opportunity to create a space for those conversations to happen and to put pressure on regulators. And in the beginning, you know, Nick, my husband was a bit, are you sure you want to do this? I mean, we've spent so much time like not being political, being, you know, even as Ed would say, revelatory instead of accusatory as a way of bringing in more people into the tent, into the, in, into the conversation of what our impacts are on the earth. This is a different story. And it, it's actually quite refreshing, even though I'm sure we're gonna get like nailed one way or a, a, another, it's really quite refreshing to be able to just say, we're going for it with this. Wow. We'll come back to that ish, um, the topic or the meaning of impact later in the conversation, but I'd like to transition to the trilogy. So, you know, um, for people that have not seen your work or people that have seen your work, Manufactured Landscapes, Watermark and Anthropocene, that was very collaborative uh, work with artist photographer, Edward Bertinsky and your, your, your life partner, cinematographer and producer, uh, Nick Depensier. And, I'd like to show clips from this work and have you speak to your choices, um, cinematically, um, thematically. Um, I guess we should start with the earliest in work our way. Okay. Um, so let's go to that clip.
that, that clip was is it's nine minutes long. It's nine and a half minutes long. It's an opening sequence, and it's one take. And uh, it was literally um, maybe we could put up that the 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 photograph of Ed's that can sort of describe the dilemma and how we tried to respond to the dilemma. And that is, so when I first encountered Bertinsky's photographs, I remember thinking that I was looking at, you know, a, a beautiful abstract painting and it was at a dinner party or something. And I, as I went in closer to the painting, I realized that it was a photograph of densified oil filters and they kind of recoiled in horror and thought, oh God, who would take a picture of that? Even though it's really interesting visually. And then I thought, oh my God, that's garbage. And then the revelation came to me that that was my garbage, that the garbage was my own. And I thought, isn't that an interesting process of revelation and consciousness simply through the presentation of waste, basically. And I started thinking about his work and investigating his work and seeing how um, he uses scale essentially uh, with the implication of detail in the photographs, but they're mostly scale in order to kind of represent human impact on the earth in all different ways from extraction to manufacturing, to recycling and waste, to use, consumer use. And um, I really wanted to work with him, but I wanted to make a film that intelligently translated the meaning of those photographs into a time-based medium. And I thought, you know, if I if I just show these photographs in a film format, what's the point? Like, what? Why would I? Why do that? There's the, just go see the photographs, right? And I also didn't want to do a biography of the artist because it felt like no, the meaning is in the work. That's where the story lies. So when we went to China with Ed, um, the very first trip that we did, and Nick couldn't come because our our children were young and somebody had to stay home with them. And so Peter Mettler came as a cinematographer and he was a colleague of Ed's at uh, Ryerson, now Metropolitan University. And Peter and I got to this factory, which is three quarters of a kilometer long, this one factory floor. And we were like, how are we gonna convey the scale of this place? And you can see at the top, there are those sort of catwalks. So we went up and we walked all the way along and we were sort of thinking, okay, well, do we shoot from up here? Do we go to the same uh, location that Ed did, which was at the end, he went up on a lift and he took two pictures of either side and put them together into this diptych. So this diptych became the kind of conundrum of how do you convey scale and time um, as a way of conveying the message of human impact on the earth. And, I just kept thinking, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. We can go one row at a time and that would take us 10 hours. We already blew through a, a week's allotment of film in one day trying to get the shot. And when Peter suggested, let's do it as a dolly, because there were, we, we both looked, there was this girl driving along in a golf cart. And of, of course, you know, factory floors are very smooth because they're cement and flat. And he said, let's try it as a dolly. And it was the perfect, opening for this film because we, so Peter and I are in the golf cart. He's um, a, a, in one you know take, he was pulling focus and moving in on people. And another, he just did it flat. We had our sound recorder, Sanjay Mehta, walking in front of us backwards with a, um, a boom pole. John Price, the assistant camera was um, pulling focus for Peter. And I was watching what was going on and kind of trying to nudge them towards people who were surreptitiously looking up and then looking back down. This is not a culture of open inquiry in China. And it certainly wasn't then when we made this film in the early 2000s. But basically, when we had done that shot and completed it, I knew it was going to be the opening of the film because uh -huh. it conveys yeah. scale in time, but also the way that you experience that as a viewer is that you know you start off and it's kind of interesting and then you're like oh my god this is going on forever like you start to get bored and then your attention you know wanders a bit and then you come back to it and then you start to get angry <laughs> and it's only through boredom and anger that you emerge into a true understanding of scale and so basically that 
template of trying to convey scale and time became the, um, uh, the driver of this film and the work that we have done with Ed subsequently in the trilogy, but also the deep knowledge and understanding from a filmmaking perspective and also from an ethics of engagement perspective that scale only has meaning when it is paired with detail. And it's a constant dialectic back and forth between those two elements that creates a story. So after this opening shot, we go to close up on the faces of the women making spray mechanisms for irons, which you can just imagine is one of the most deadening jobs that you could ever have to do that all day. And that's what they do all day long, every day. And it's only in seeing their faces and kind of being with them in that moment, that close up moment, that you understand the mundane aspect of production and the fact that those irons that we buy at wherever we go, the hardware store, are painstakingly put together by somebody halfway around the world. Um, and ironically, when they're thrown away, they go back to China into the aluminum recycling yards where they're picked up again by people who are working there and dismantled. So that was the beginning of this relationship. Yeah. And, you know, it's like a entry point to this patient sort of immersion um, that the rest of the film as it unfolds requires that mindfulness uh, from the viewer. Uh, by abstaining from, you know, uh, voiceover narration, um, graphics, music, all of these tropes that are conventional and standard and also very commercial um, within the documentary form, um, typically. Um, there is that, you know, I like that you're resisting that and pushing against that by offering uh, a totally different um, experience and I wonder though, um, do you think in retrospect, and I remember that shot being talked about, you know, and watched over and over again. And I also know that you shot it on film. And I also know that you called Nick and said, we need more mags. I know. Do more takes. And he was like, what? <laughs> that was your, that was a week. That was your film for a week and you've blown through, through it. Yeah. And I was like, well, I yeah. know. And you know, so, I've, I've never been able to say <clears throat> in a film, except for Watermark, where I knew what the ending was going to be, that that was the opening sequence. And I knew it. And yeah, it, knew. I, I knew it, yeah, I knew it like from that. the very beginning. And it really, um, and also, yes, that, you know, believe me, a lot of people tried to talk us out of that. The, the you know, our commissioning editor, um, our, our people who saw it and said, this is okay, I get what you're doing, but it's really boring. We're going to lose a lot of viewers here. I said, well, that's, that's, that's the price we pay. Yeah, and so that's a bold choice. And, um, you know, and, and so who was the broadcaster? And did they, did you have to, when you, did nope. you cut it down? Did you have to make that? Call? No, 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 no. Okay. We 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 went with the whole okay. thing, and thank God nice. that we did. And uh, and 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 it sort of came around. Like I, it's so interesting, and also it really was a collaboration with Peter. That scene in particular, yeah. and the film, um, in some ways, because in many cases we were while I was still negotiating whether we could shoot somewhere in these locations. Um, Peter and I would have a sort of secret conversation, and he'd go off and start shooting. And by the time people came back and said we weren't allowed, we had enough footage to be able to leave. So we would do, we sort of worked like that. It was complicated then to, as it is now um, to shoot in China. But that, I, I guess in terms of the 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 environmental focus, um, that, that idea of witnessing these places um, that you're responsible for but would never normally see, really played out in that film and also extended into the others in the trilogy. But I will say that the 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 biggest struggle in manufa in manufactured landscapes was trying to get that detail that set the scale off. And when you're a photographer and you're standing back and you're taking stills and everything's quiet, people don't bug you as much as when you say, well, I'd like to go in and film the faces of the women, or I'd like to interview these people. I wanted to interview those women making the spray mechanisms. We were not allowed. When we interviewed 
the woman who was a welder in the shipbuilding yards, um, we got kicked out uh, after that because we were interfering. We weren't talking to the official spokespeople of that place. So the attempt to like, you know, be, to, to, to show context through detail was really difficult. Like we had to fight for it there and it became easier in Watermark and then it became harder in Anthropocene again. Let's go to Watermark and, and discuss, uh, let's throw to that clip right now and then we'll come back and talk about that. Okay. Pues antes estaba muy bonito el río, muy antes. Y pues el río Colorado estaba muy lleno, mucha agua, había mucho pescado, mucho bocón, mucha lisa, mucho pescado. Se secó y nos venimos. Se murió todo el pescado. The, the devastation of, of drought and, you know, that the Colorado River has dried up um, and having, you know, the, that woman, can you talk about access? So I, I, I find that just so dramatic that there she is standing in this empty space, reflecting on her, her memory and her past of, you know, that's very dramatic. Well, and also, I mean, there, there's two, there's two things there in the, just, to, just from the sort of factual point, the Colorado River is the most dammed river in, in the United States. And it's by the time it reaches the border of Mexico, it kind of limps across the border and dies. And it's because of those dams. So what used to be this incredibly rich delta, and we know that deltas are the nurseries of the sea, right? It's where the birds go with their eggs. It's where the shrimp go. Um, it, it's because it's it's a um, what's the what it's called? It's a mix of, of of salt and fresh water, so it's more gentle, right? And so th those those are hugely important ecosystems, and. When you dam a river, it just doesn't work anymore. So that, that's one thing. And there were there's a few different ways of trying to convey that information in a film. And I would say that what I had seen in conventional documentaries that bothered me was that you'd you might use somebody who was, you know, involved in it or connected to that landscape in some way as a sort of intro. And then you'd go to an expert who would tell you why this thing was happening. Why is it like that? And well, this is what we found in our work and you know our studies and stuff. And not only is that an extremely sort of Western rationalist perspective that also doesn't really assign or parse the question of blame, um, it's not authentic in terms of the knowledge that you're getting. And so this also speaks to the ethics of engagement and the detail that sets off scale. So you go right up and you see that little boat and it's vast. But Don Innocencia is standing on that parched ground, this place that used to be a totally rich ecosystem that um, supported her whole nation, the Kukupa Nation. Most of the people have moved away. Um, there's just nothing left for them there. And it, to me, it, her story is the only story we need to know to understand that landscape. We don't need if you want to know science, go to Encyclopedia Britannica, go look it up on Wikipedia, whatever. But this is about her. And 
I think from, you know, I'm not going to go into a big thing about my own background, but because I came from a bicultural um, household where we were, you know, a little bit, <laughs> both sides were a bit suspicious of us because we were, you know, just sort of to ourselves, I learned to look at things from the margins instead of from the center. And I, at, you know, when I was growing up, that was hard. I mean, it felt like, well, God, why can't I just be like right in the middle? And now I realize that, oh God, it's the biggest gift in my work to find the skewed perspective, find the perspective that is not the dominant perspective to tell a story. And so this scene first really, I think kind of illustrates that, but also um, why detail is necessary to give scale meaning and also the ethics of engagement as a documentary filmmaker. Like I go, we go all over the world with our films and there's something incredibly arrogant about putting a camera in somebody's face and asking them to talk or do what they're doing. Um, and even the language of, of, of filmmaking is, it, it's like hunting, shooting, getting it in the bag, cutting, like it's just, yeah. when I think about that at all, it, it just, it, it, it kind of drives me crazy. So to me, the, the only way to ethically engage with context when you're coming from outside of it is with utter humility. Like it, it, it is about relinquishing control, listening, finding out, like being there enough long enough that you can feel what the context is and how to convey it. And then having a real relationship with the people and the context and the other species that you're, you know, engaging with. Um, because if you don't have that authentic exchange of vulnerability, as I've called it before, like, or yeah, then, then it doesn't work. Not only is it unethical, it also doesn't work. So that, that is kind of a, a moment in Watermark where, um, uh, it, it's her story and 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 we we have to uh, honor and also make that clear to people. And it's that, you know, that fine balance between, you know, precise research and 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 facts and science, which you bring into your work, but also where is the emotion, the subjectivity, and how do you balance those things so that there is that sort of, soul within the work and and so for me that's what that I remember that moment so well I'm I'm glad because it's also about um it sort of speaks a bit to our research process which is we do an enormous amount of research like you know for Anthropocene we research for a year they they usually it usually takes a really long time and we have all of this you know, you sort of start with the thing and then you do these concentric circles out and you go out as far as you can go without losing complete relevance to what you're talking about. But so that you get this, this really big reservoir, right? And, and then you forget about it all and you go on, you don't forget, like it's in there, but you don't reference that. We never have scripts. We never even have, you know, I was trying to do something for, somebody asked me to do a television program and they said, well, you know, we'll do the beat sheet. And I was like, what's beat sheet? Like, wh what does that mean? And it really is like, this is what you have to hit yeah. in the episode. And I was like, well, how can you do that when you don't know what's going to happen when you're there? You have to be there. And so it, it is about a philosophy of, of shooting, which is, and, and filmmaking, which is have a plan, but be ready to abandon it at any moment. Um, and also learn a lot and then just kind of let that recede so that when you're in the moment, you are in the context and you're submitting to it and you're following where it leads or your subjects lead and you're going, you're, you're going along with it. And, you know, it's not a very efficient way of working because we have huge shooting ratios as a result, but I, I'd way rather do that um, than dictate that it, it it really is about relinquishing control, which is really hard when you've got, you know, big budgets and you've got a big crew and everybody's standing around wanting to be ordered around or expecting to be ordered around. And you're kind of like, let's just wait and see what happens with this scene over here. So so with the with Anthropocene, which is the third, the final piece of the trilogy, um, you actually had 
and maybe you still it maybe it's still active, but a, a very far-reaching educational campaign associated with um, the film as a multimedia experience. Um, you know, let's go to a clip for Anthropocene, and I'd love to hear about that campaign and as it, as it relates to the environment and. Um, which I think will be of great interest to our viewers to hear about that. Incredible, you know, flower bursting through the stone. Like it's just, uh, you know, as a filmmaker, knowing what goes into every shot and location and, and how much work um, goes on to get to that moment. And so I'm, 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 I'm quite uh, blown away by the access, you know, that you, that you <clears throat> got all through these films is the access to these, you know, to the scale, but also these intimate um, visual details with people. But also there's a, I, this is a, another philosophical question for you um, that I know you've put a lot of thought into, which is that these devastating environments, um, the impact and but yet there's this majesty and this incredible beauty to these shots. How, what is the risk and what is the balance or the sort of that fine line between the representation of these spaces and moments? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, okay. um, th there's, there's a lot going on there. And it's when you think about it from the very beginning, which was this, 
conveying scale and time, and then the the sort of ethical and story driven um, addition of detail as a way of 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 making that story whole. Uh, and then you're right, the research and access, like Anthropocene was our longest and biggest project. I, I think it all nearly killed us and we all needed to be working full out the whole time to get it done, Ed, Nick, my husband and myself. Um, this is in Norilsk, Siberia, and there's, there's a few things going on there. First of all, it took us a year to get in there. Um, it's a closed city, so you have to have a specific reason to go. We said we were doing this art, art project, and so we were allowed in. We were uh, arrested there and fingerprinted. In fact, I have my cup here. I'll just show you. There I am. There. I was so mad because I was trying to watch the Wimbledon final um, because we had a free night, and, and it was I found the only place in town that had the stream, and I made a reservation, and, and it was my favorite tennis player, Roger Federer, who just retired, and uh, I, they kept us. And all I could see on my phone was the sort of 2-1, 30 love, kind of just no nothing. Like I couldn't watch it or anything because we didn't have the data and I was so angry. And at the end, after we'd been sitting there for like six hours, there was this woman came and picked up her purse and we realized they were probably... <laughs> recording us and Nick thinks that they're still trying to parse the code of who does she mean when she's talking about Federer and what is the, like what, what's the political context of this but it was so they arrested us because they said we'd come in under false pretenses and we were journalists instead of artists because we talked to those women in their coffee break in the smelter and I was like wait a second I just wanted to hear about their lives why does that make us journalists, so it became this incredible semantic argument um, that we, you know, it was a standoff essentially. And then they kept harassing us for the rest of the shoot. But what the interesting thing about that in terms of um, places you're connected to but would never normally see is that Norilsk has the biggest tri-metal smelter in the world, nickel, copper, and palladium. And palladium is the metal that is in every cell phone in the world. And so there's a good chance that my phone and your phone and all of our phones has palladium in it from Norilsk. But we'd never think about that. No one's ever gonna go there and, and understand that. So part of the, this is getting to the aesthetic argument, the, the long shots, the beauty, the resolution, the scale is, it's sort of twofold. It's, it's allowing you as a viewer to be in that environment without being told what to think, without being guided how to feel, but just to witness it experientially. And I think that that takes a cue from what Ed is trying to do with his photographs, but with the addition of time, sound, movement, there it can be very immersive. And if it is not shot well, or it's ugly, or it's then, then you're going to recoil from it and you're going to say no, right? So there's something about the aesthetics the seduction of the aesthetics that brings you into a relationship with that place so you contemplate it for long enough to understand it without immediately turning away uh, and, and there are arguments like I think I, I don't know how many questions we've got about why do you make ugly things look beautiful and and first of all that's kind of a simplistic question but it is also about the the nature of cinema number one like using the tools of cinema um, at, as best you can, but also about the invitation to come in and to spend time, especially when there is not a lot of information being thrown at you. You know, we live in a culture now that is, I won't say incapable, but let's say impaired when it comes to, to sustained reflection. And sustained reflection is more possible when you sometimes don't know what you're looking at. Like, why are those people in that devastated landscape? Well, that's their beach. They're at the beach because it's sunny. That's the beach. That's what becomes your beach when you live in Norilsk. And all those people, the guys in the smelter, you know, they have the little tubes. They're sucking oxygen all the time because the air is, is so polluted there. It's one of the most polluted places on earth. So that speaks to that, those points, I think. Um, regarding the, the scale of Anthropocene just as a project, this was a point where after making two films together, we were trying to think about, okay, what is the 
best lens-based approach to convey the environmental message that we're conveying or the environment or the context that we're conveying. And so we used everything. Like this is, we would, we would be shooting film, we'd be shooting 360 VR, we'd be taking photographs for augmented reality, Ed would be taking photographs, and we'd be recording sound. We were doing all of those things all at the same time to try to find the best way to use lens-based media to um, convey where we were. And so we had a feature documentary, we had a museum exhibition, which is still traveling. It's about to go to Argentina, actually, um, uh, that has photographs, video installations, augmented reality installations, murals with augmented reality interventions. Um, you know, it's it's this huge exhibition. There's two books that are associated with it. And it's an educational program that we did in partnership with the Canadian Geographic Society, where this little like suitcase goes around to all the schools in Canada. And you can open it up and there's a floor map where you are experiencing these environments and through VR, et cetera, through interaction. So we really tried to pull out all the stops, I suppose, to um, try to make this word that at the time when we made the film, I would say maybe 5% of the population that I interacted with had any idea what Anthropocene meant. And it was, well, let's try to make this more of a, um, more known, like more of a household term. And the term means the human epoch. And it is a geological epoch that there are a group of geologists, the Anthropocene Working Group, that are trying to officially have the epoch recognized that we're at the end of the Holocene and we have entered the Anthropocene. And why have we entered the Anthropocene? Because humans now change the planet more than all natural processes combined. And that's a pretty important concept for us to understand. Um, so Jen, with Into the Weeds, your current uh, documentary, which everyone uh, can stream on, on CBC Gem for free across this country. Um, tell us what you learned. You know, every film is like a, a mini PhD in the subject, like which is probably it's still the sort of research nerd in me that I love doing that stuff. But this one was really heavy. Like we had to learn all of the science, which was incredibly complex. Then we had to learn about, you know, how a trial works. But there's there's these these elements, like for example, um, the idea of of corporate malfeasance that comes out. There are these things called the Monsanto papers that were brought out in Discovery because in Discovery both sides get access to a whole bunch of information and what used to be you know, two sets of lawyers teams sitting in an airplane hangar with thousands of bankers boxes has now become computers and artificial intelligence. There were over 15 million documents originally that had to be gone through in this case. And you, you see how the AI can actually find the, the things that, that show the malfeasance. So we have evidence of ghostwriting, we have evidence of um, targeting uh, individuals, both journalists and scientists, independent scientists who are were writing against, you know, and outside of the Monsanto corporate umbrella and writing questions. They their attack on IARC, uh, the International Association for Research on Cancer, when they declared glyphosate as a probable human carcinogen in 2015. Um, you know, they were they had a massive budget. Their budget was. Their, their public affairs budget for that year was around $17 million. And most of that went towards trying to discredit IARC um, before the decision had even come down. So learning about cor corporate malfeasance was huge. There's also the question of mass torts um, as, as a kind of uh, incomplete tool for justice. Mass torts are about, you know, usually a huge group of individuals coming together to sue one corporation and they they bring them together into what they call multi-district litigation so it's not like every trial goes out with a different lawyer with a different set of facts etc they usually do it under one umbrella judge and 
what happens is it allows those cases to be tried more smoothly. And so it doesn't just completely, you know, gum up the court system for years and years. But mass torts are limited to their money damages. So number one, it is the only way that an ordinary citizen can take on a multinational like this. Because if you don't have a lawyer or a group of lawyers who are willing to put up millions of dollars on spec, uh, in order to try these cases, they only get paid, you know, if 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 they win, um, it would never happen. Nobody would have the resources to do that. So that's the good side of it. It's sort of like as 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 Mike Miller says in the film, it's the every person's key to the courthouse. On the other hand, it's money damages only, and these companies, as we know, have billions of dollars, and so does it really hurt them to pay these fines? And in the old days, the fines were less than actually what it would cost to, you know, dispose of waste, for example, um, properly. So they just do it and pay the fine because the fine was less. So, you know, I guess my thought is why aren't these executives going to jail when it is proved that their product hurts people? That's so learning about the limitations of mass torts. And then this this thing called agency capture, which is that the agencies that are set up through governments, through public institutions that are um, intended to protect the public, like the Environmental Protection Agency, like Health Canada, for example, or the PMRA, the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. Um, what ends up happening is that they, they, they are captured by industry and and that to me was one of the most shocking things that we learned and there's a clip that shows uh, explains that a bit better than i can this agency that was supposed to be set up to protect the environment in the wake of a silent spring is really working for the industry it was created to protect us from that's who they talk to every single day and they work together to compromise and the compromise 90% of the time goes in favor of the corporation. EPA has been captured by industry. And until they get uncaptured, uh, we're just not going to get them to protect us. They're going to protect the industries that they regulate. How do you beat that? Right? How do you overcome that, you know, cartel? These huge corporations have such access to EPA, and you and I don't. Right? So citizens don't really have, we can't really go to EPA and say, you know, you know what you're doing to our, our environment, to insects, to people, they don't have that access. So in the absence of regulatory agencies that are actually working for the people that they're meant to protect, this seems to be the only way that, that we can call those corporations to account. And, and, and learning that was extraordinary. Incredible. In the, uh, the, the hot docs um, report, uh, document that was released a few years ago about you know impact you know quote unquote impact uh the definition used as you know social and cultural change that has been driven by a documentary film and its associated campaign strategy so it really is you know the impact space let's say um as a global space that contains these um these films so I guess the question for you, knowing that you had you have that, you know, multidisciplinary um, educational program with Anthropocene, um, now with Into the Weeds, is impact within the context of that meaning, is that important to you? Hugely. And um, it might be worth uh, that there's a couple of things that we should look at. Maybe we should begin with the ubiquity of use. I'd like to look at that because and I can talk over it to describe the, the herbicide that we're talking about in, in Into the Weeds is called glyphosate. It's the world's most widely used herbicide. It is everywhere. 80% of us in the world have it in our urine. Um, it's one of those things that is ubiquitous. And so if, if we want to just look at that, um, the clip that shows ubiquity of use, and I can talk a bit about that and the campaign that emerged.
So you see in that last shot um, of forests, all the conifers, the spruce and pine that are basically plantations are alive, but all the broadleaf species, the white skeletons of trees are, have died because those forests have been sprayed aerially as a way of controlling the broadleaf species so that they don't compete with the spruce and pine that are then you know, harvested. So what used to be forests are essentially plantations, they're monocultures. And that of course has an unbelievable effect on, on biodiversity. Um, not only after spraying do the animals go away for years, um, like literally something like seven years, but we were just, I was just in Prince George for an impact screening two nights ago and where they also spray. And there was a plant biologist there who has done studies showing that glyphosate remains in plant tissue and fiber for up to 12 years after being sprayed. Um, and this is just such a, like, it, it's like using a sledgehammer to cut butter. Like you're, 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 you're spraying everything, you're killing everything in the environment that is not the plantation thing. It's going into the soil, the birds, the insects, et cetera. So there's a there there's there's an enormous systemic impact there, and it's just it's it's primarily because it's cheaper and easier to get some guy up in a plane spraying rather than having you know sheep graze uh, cut blocks to, to to get rid of the broadleaf species or hand picking or or different kinds of um, ways that do not involve even hand targeted spraying is better than that right and so. I wanted to show ubiquity of use to kind of drive home how much this chemical is in our lives and environments. Um, that That's one thing. And then the idea of um, impact. So when I'm talking about like using the film as a tool for a targeted tool for regulatory change. When I've taught, think, thought about impact campaigns in the past and how they kind of were at the beginning, it just reminded me of like, the filmmaker with their backpack on and their DVDs in the back and they're just trudging along the road, getting paid two bucks for every screening. Like it, it, it's, it was an unsustainable model because there, there was no there were no resources attached to it. It's not like you can put an impact campaign into your production budget when you're getting money to make these films. And so, you know, it, it, it's very difficult to amplify them in the, in, in the right ways. And, and I think that once we learned that we were getting into this period of a lot of regulatory reviews, the thought that we could, okay, let's have these screenings. Let's have debates about, about what is going on. Let's screen for parliament, let's screen for the EU, let's screen for the uh, people in Washington or decision makers or who are adjacent to the EPA, et cetera, um, to try to influence change. And so for the first time, I feel that we have an impact campaign that is really robust and it's well supported. We, we were able to raise money for this, which was, you know, astonishing and it's a different thing than Anthropocene which is about awareness raising so as many people that see that the better this is more like oh no let's let the people who see it who are actually making these decisions and so um, Into the Weeds has uh, a slightly different focus and it also is totally unequivocal about um I suppose it's the closest we've come when I say things are, when they're black and white, it's reductive. Well, in this case, it is a little more black and white. And that's based on not just opinion, but evidence. Fantastic. Um, so the practice of, of making these films, the production involved, the equipment, the travel, um, the resources, um, and, you know, over a span of time, and then there's post-production and, you know, so much, uh, you know, equipment. Increasingly, there is an ethos around uh, reducing our footprint and practicing uh, in new ways uh, that can embody some kind of sustainable, um, more sustainable, uh, not just the thinking, but the resources. And, and I think this is becoming, I think this is the future. 
And I know you have a story to tell with this. So over to you, talk about the sustainability practice um, with this. I'll start by saying that when we when we made Anthropocene, I used to lay awake at night and think about the footprint of our production and whether it was even just possible to offset the footprint of our production and the travel, et cetera, um, based on the impact that the project would have in terms of awareness raising. And, you know, the jury's still out on that. Like, it, it could be you know, what's the best thing you can do for the planet? Well, just you know, some, some monk said once, just go to sleep. Like do, do no harm basically is the best thing that we can all do. And yes, there is that. And I'm, I, I still grapple with our footprint uh, production wise, but since we've always been incredibly mindful of how we work and at, as far back as payback, which I I don't even know the exact date of payback, but the film that we made of Margaret Atwood's Massey Lectures with the National Film Board. And at that point, nobody was offsetting. And offsetting is, is not the answer. It's not like just burn through whatever you want and then just you know get somebody to do some offset program. It used to be tree planting. That's more problematic now because how do you guarantee that those trees don't get cut down at some point? Um, there are still ways of using trees, but there are much more interesting offset options, carbon offset options globally. It becomes a question of, you know, um, how, how useful is that really? But it's kind of the least we can do, right? So for payback, we went to the film board and said, we need a budget. We need to put in our budget that we're offsetting this film. And they, they didn't do that then. And we had to fight for that. Say, are you kidding? Like, we'll pay for it, but we have to do it. Like, it, it's... It's this this is a film about environmental themes and essentially and you know debt and environmental debt is one of the debts that we have and and if we're not going to pay that debt it's not going to work. And so we argued and argued and we finally were able to do it, and then, even at that point, it was hard to find an offsetter that was even doing film work it wasn't it wasn't a normal. Um, it wasn't a, there wasn't a template for it, so we kind of you know. Um, tried to invented that template. And that doesn't just end with, you know, you went in a car, you went on a plane, you stayed in this hotel. It's the electricity use for post-production. We even went so far as to go to um, offsetting screenings using bullfrog power or, 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 or um, sustainably generated power for our screenings. And in the old days, when you used to have print traffic, you know, the print traffic would be, then you'd, you'd want to you know, you'd, you'd also want to offset those costs, those travel costs. Now that we can do these Aspera links and it's, it's, it's easier, there doesn't have to be the same physical kind of uh, movement that, 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 that there used to be. But um, it's still not totally widely accepted in the industry. And, and, it, and the thing about SPF and these organizations that are really pushing for sustainable production and giving um, filmmakers and uh, you know production uh, production companies a template and a, a way to be able to do it it's absolutely crucial we're right now um, in the process of trying to evaluate the the carbon footprint of the Toronto Film Festival and it's been I'm on the board there and I'm I'm deeply invested in in the carbon neutrality of TIFF. And we we're, we've, we had to create a template for actually evaluating the carbon footprint of a film festival. And then my idea was, okay, and then we'll just give it away for free to all the other festivals so that everybody can use it. So these things are developing, developing, developing. Um, and I, I feel like it's, you know, you talk the talk, so you have to walk the walk. And so if I'm gonna walk the walk, it's either that I'm just gonna go to bed and retire and not do anything to be as small in my footprint as possible. Or if I am doing this kind of work and, and, and expending energy, can I do it in a way that is ethical and sustainable? And can we offset? Um, so at least we're at a kind of, it's not zero, but it's, it's better than not doing it. And it's true that when, you know, as filmmakers, when we go deep into this subject matter, it changes us and it changes how you know we want to live and how we see the world and and then ultimately the films are doing that work in the world as well 
thank you so much, Jen. It's been incredible to catch up with you and to hear you speak so eloquently and deeply um, about your work. And Liz, you're such a you're such an incredible person to talk to. It's like having a deeply enlightened conversation, and uh, I can't wait to see you in person. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you.